Um, so let me update you on where we are with that ending cholera roadmap. <clears throat> For the newcomers, you have a co few copies of that uh, roadmap document in the back over there, but I'm sure you are all very familiar now with that uh, strategy that we've launched in, in that same room in October 2017, and trying to reach, uh, reduce the number of deaths by 90% uh, by 2030, and get at least 20 countries to stop transmission, uh, eliminate the, the, the disease. Um, and for this, we have uh, that beautiful partnership called the GTFCC for the newcomers. Not easy to remember, but you'll see, you get used to it. Um, which about, we are about 40 or 50 you now institutions um, participating very actively. <coughs> and that roadmap has essentially three main axes. Number one, early detection and immediate response to outbreak in an effort to try to contain them at an early stage. We all know that once an outbreak is out of the box, it becomes very difficult to control, as we have seen in Yemen in 2017. That's the most recent example. Uh, we have someone from Zimbabwe, I think over there. Uh, they managed uh, last year in October really to contain at an early stage, and I think within two or three months, the outbreak is now over. The second very important uh, axis is that multi-sectoral uh, response uh, targeting the cholera hotspot that's very central to the strategy. And obviously, as Tim was saying uh, earlier, the WASH interventions here are critical. They are really at the core of this strategy, and we are not going to eliminate cholera anywhere uh, without that capacity to implement long-term WASH interventions, development-oriented focusing on those hotspots. And those hotspots is only, what, 4 to 8 percent of the population. And as we'll see later with, uh, with uh, dear Melissa over there, uh, it's a very cost-effective intervention because you target the most, the most at-risk areas, the more impoverished people, etc. <clears throat> so that's basically what we are trying to do. We are trying to move away from the main focus, which until very recently was on outbreak response, shipping kits, uh, cholera establishing cholera treatment centers um, for responding to outbreak, and then wait for the next one, right? Uh, it's still like this in many places. Uh, we have used a lot uh, of oral cholera vaccine to try to bridge uh, this emergency type of response with what we want to achieve, with this, which is long-term watch for, for development. Um, vaccines have played a key role. They still play a key role, we need really to make progress in attaching the wash component so that we can really sustain the, 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 the stop of transmission uh, thanks to vaccines. So in a sense, moving from preparedness and response to really prevention and control. That's how we are going to achieve to, to eliminate that. I don't see many other alternatives, but if someone has a good idea, most welcome. Um, so last year, essentially, we're talking of the last, what, 15, 18 months. Um, I've been, and many of you have, uh, here in that room have been on the cholera world for decades, and we have gray hair for some of us. I'm very pleased to see also young people so we can retire, huh, Renault, for example. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the last, I mean, for me, is the first time I see that dynamic uh, being, being uh, on cholera. Uh, and it's on, it's on the agenda where I think we have been uh, relatively good at advocacy. We need to be much, much more active, and in particular, uh, and that's why we are here today, and that's why you have that mix of countries and partners uh, and donors. Um, it's because now we have to implement things at country level, and in particular, we need to implement to wash long-term control activities at country level. And we have a number of countries, most of them in the room today, uh, which are now really engaging on elimination plans. Uh, Zimbabwe is engaging, Zambia over there uh, is engaging, uh, Kenya is not engaging, you will tell us more maybe, uh, uh, John, uh, Zanzibar is engaging on elimination plans. It is still at the stage of a plan uh, and we need to get our act together at the country level, be as GTFCC, put ourselves in, in a situ in capacity to support those countries so that what is a plan become a reality uh, at the country level. We have also a number of countries, some in the room, who have engaged in very large-scale vaccination campaign, like Nigeria, they're here, uh, DRC, uh, and Uganda, they have launched 
very large scale vaccination campaign. Now the challenge for them is to add to, add, to append uh, the, the WASH component. And that's going to be uh, complicated in some areas, but I guess in some others, should that be a big, big, uh, a big deal? AT is, is uh, represented in the room as well, uh, and uh, they have been, they have made, we had a recent call with them and with the office of the, of, of the UN. They have made amazing progress in, in reducing the disease burden. There are still some transmission ongoing, and they are now entering the last three or four years of their elimination plan. The, the last mile, like Mark was referring to, it's a very critical moment for that country. We can demonstrate that there, that it works, that we can eliminate, that we can, that we can really make progress beyond the case reduction, really stop the, the transmission. And we have also representative from, representative from Bangladesh. And for those who, are, who were here last time, I think it was, when did uh, Prof Azad came, I forgot. And uh, when there was the DG of, of Bangladesh, uh, Minister of Health. And for the first time, I heard a high level representative from Bangladesh saying the word cholera. That's a country which she does not report cholera, but no openly they speak about cholera. And for me, that we still have a few countries uh, right from, from Ethiopia over there, we still need to make progress there, but we see more and more that openness, the political blockage disappearing one by one. It's not full 100% uh, successful everywhere. Ethiopia, Sudan, Djibouti, uh, and a few others. But overall, I feel that uh, with some exceptions, we are making a very significant progress there as well. What we have seen as well is very strong uh, donors and partners engagement. This is now clear and when you look at the room today and <clears throat> for those who are in the first WASH working group meetings, the difference is huge. We have much more partner engaged. Uh, big thanks to the, to the Fondation Merieu to start with. That's a very nice place uh, to stay, of course, but also very active in, in getting to things uh, organized and helping all of you organizing their, their travel, even if sometimes it's a bit uh, complicated for, for many reasons. The CDC is now supporting uh, at the country level. And that, again, that's, we, are not, we don't want to build a big machine in Geneva, in New York, or wherever, or even in Paris. Uh, it's about country implementation, country support. Uh, and that's exactly where the CDC position herself. John is one of the representatives. We are also getting support from the lab side. At, uh, in the country. The UNICEF is very engaged uh, with the, the support from, uh, from Monica, the support from Guy on, on the development of the investment case, extremely uh, important and very welcome. We've seen the difference in the, in the setup and, uh, of that working group in particular. The difference is huge and, and thanks very much to, to Monica for the support she's, she's giving to the, to the task force. The IFRC, they are here as well and they have launched their One Wash project. I guess you will tell us more later um, today, and if not, it will be tomorrow, but you will te tell us more. I know that you have been quite successful to know, and that's exactly the type of project we need uh, to, to, to really tackle the disease. And we have a number of those uh, NGOs present here, engaging on, on, on WASH, like Solidarité in DRC, like MSF, CF, MEDER, etc., supporting the vaccination campaign in places where it's not always easy to do, where the governments are, have weak capacities, have been very important in, in helping get, get to things, uh, their act together. And we have seen that in places like Somalia or, or even in Yemen, you reach something like 65 or 70 percent coverage. In, in places like this, I mean, for me, it's, it's quite a good result, um, given the insecurity, the problem of access and the two those campaigns. And the Gates Foundation continue to support the, the, the Global Task Force Secretariat. It's not official, but I understand they will continue to support us. Please um, support me on that. And they have also supported the development of the, of the investment case. Gavi has renewed his support uh, for, the, for the OCV stockpiles. They are also supporting with uh, technical assistance in country. We have a number of people we are trying to put in the countries using the, the Gavi support. They support also the surveillance. So it's not only the, the vaccine themselves. Uh, they are also supporting some research activities together with the Wellcome Trust and, uh, and the UK Aid, supporting very significant uh, portfolio of research activities. We had the first uh, meeting uh, last month. And I understand it's going to, to continue. That's very uh, significant and important in, in the support for the implementation of the roadmap. And um, probably more importantly, even 
um, what I see happening in the country is that more and more the development donors uh, are repurposing in a sense or retargeting their long-term watch project to the cholera hotspot. The intervention in DRC, in, in Uvira, or in uh, Kalemi, for example, uh, and many others are really the type of interventions we are looking at, watch development, targeting hotspot. So let me go more quickly you know, on, on the progress we're observing, maybe by chance, uh, but I hope not. It's not by chance. Uh, you will agree with me. It's not by chance. We are making progress in many of those countries. Look at Haiti and like the colors. Thank you very much for my colleagues from the power office. They started in 2013. And look at this. We have how many cases since the beginning of the year? They remain small, few uh, places still reporting cases. We started with, uh, what, 40 days a day, maybe more. Uh, and we are at 40 days uh, since the beginning, I mean, I forgot how many, but it, the, the difference is huge, and you will tell us more. Huh? At the beginning, eh? At the beginning, yeah. Yeah. Still not one. We still have transmission there, and we shouldn't, of course, stop. Uh, Yemen, uh, we talked a lot about Yemen last, in 2017. When in 18, they had much less transmission there. Um, of course, there's still that huge overestimation of cases, but last week they had 28 lab-confirmed cases in Yemen. Uh, still there is ongoing transmission, but much less. It didn't spread uh, last summer during the rainy season in July, uh, contrary to 2017. And as I was saying, uh, their, their vaccine campaign was quite used, successful. That's typically a place like South Sudan or Somalia, where you really, of course, rely much more on vaccine than on than on wash long term. And talking of Somalia, uh, look at the, in, in, in 17, they had a very bad cholera year, 75,000 cases, 1,000 deaths. Uh, in, in, in a setting where it's very difficult to control, uh, they basically divided by 10, the number of cases and deaths, by 20 even for the number of deaths uh, last year. And still, for the moment, still relatively okay. I don't think we have anyone from Somalia today. In Bangladesh, remember the Rohingyas when they moved to, to Bangladesh, to the refugees, and everybody coming back from there with St. David, that time was saying, wow, the conditions are very bad in, in terms of wash. Uh, we are going to have very bad outbreaks. It's highly endemic. Uh, even if they don't call it cholera, this is cholera, and it's going to be very bad. We had no cholera outbreaks into scams uh, after the, the, Rohingya, the Rohingya refugee crisis. The wash, emergency wash interventions were super strong, uh, and they vaccinated, I forgot, uh, one or how many, uh, Lorenzo? <coughs> one million or 1.2 million people. So we have that new tool that help prevent that sort of things from occurring. South Sudan, they have no cases anymore in South Sudan since the end of 2017. The surveillance is not top of the top, but they are, they are monitoring, they are taking uh, samples of suspected cases and do, and do culture, they don't have cases anymore since more than a year. Nigeria is in the room. Uh, you have stopped transmission in, uh, in most of your states in the, in the north, and that's one of the countries engaging in large-scale vaccination. And it's one of the countries where in some states they should really engage more on WASH. Um, some say like Borno is very difficult, but others uh, like Yobe, for example, which is much more stable, they should engage much more on the wash long term. And that's our challenge today. And I was mentioning Arare, uh, almost 10,000 cases. Remember in October, was briefed by was briefing my, my big boss, uh, and the guy was, uh, it's going to be a bad outbreak this year again, because everyone remembered the, the 2008. It didn't, it didn't develop. Uh, they were super active in, in controlling uh, with WASH, and, and we vaccinated 1.2 million people. So within two, three months, the outbreak was controlled, and they are now engaging on, 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 on long-term elimination plans. Uh, word on the vaccine, I know uh, we are more focused on, 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 uh, on WASH, of course, here, but just to mention that we have shipped 40 million doses of vaccines uh, since the establishment of the stockpile. It becomes very significant in terms of impact, I guess. And, and look at the blue, uh, the blue column over there. We more and more are vaccinating the hotspots. So that's, that's the challenge for you guys. Uh, it's good to vaccinate in Yobe or in, uh, where in a DRC, I forgot, uh, we vaccinate. Uh, in, in those places, okay, good. It's going to stop transmission, that's for sure. But if we don't follow up with the wash, 
it will come back. And, and eight is in exactly the same situation. You have identified your areas to be vaccinated. I, I hope we'll do that in the, in the months to come. But if at the same place we don't do the wash, well, we are going to gain, what, two, three years, maybe less, maybe more. I don't know. It's difficult to know. But it's, it will come back, that's for sure. Yeah. So, we, I am maybe too optimistic, but my impression is that overall uh, the, 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 the feedback we are getting from, from the countries, from the, from the partners, from donors is quite positive, and we are making quite significant progress in, in a lot of, of settings. So, what could make all of this fail, and what will make us fail to reach our, our target? Um, the most important one, I believe, is the lack of engagement of some key countries. Um, country like, as I was saying, Sudan, um, still or Ethiopia, they still speak of AWD, um, and we all know that an outbreak of AWD does not exist. So, two are cholera cases. Djibouti had a bad outbreak last year. I was told very informally, but people like this and psh, don't repeat. So I'm not repeating. That no color outbreak last year. Uh, that's very bad. If, if they don't start by recognizing they have a problem, that's not going to, to work. And, and, and of course, don't, I, I, I don't want to forget India. India is one of the source of, with Bangladesh of all this pandemic, and India still does not engage really on, on cholera control. They are over, under uh, reporting, underestimating the problem, and that's something that's going to. Uh, if we don't, if we cannot get them on board, we are not going to succeed. The focus being uh, in many, still in few countries, still too much on the post outbreak. Once the outbreak is over, you all know that uh, that that's halas, we don't speak anymore about about cold. So here, here we have a window of opportunity post outbreak that we must use at the country level. What could make the story fail as well is a lack of vaccines in in a number of countries. Uh, we don't have many other resources. And of course, we know that cholera develops where places are disorganized, where there is no government sometimes, where there is very little capacity to implement long-term programs. So we need those vaccines for them. There is a change in the, in the Gavi policy, and uh, we will have to be very cautious here and working with them on how we organize the access to the stockpile, which is today maybe a bit too easy, probably, but we don't want to make it too complicated either. We, we need to find the right balance here, and that's one of the challenges of, of 2019. And the most important one for, for all of us here, in particular, is that fourth point, third point. We have vaccines, but we have no wash. Uh, and we are not going to vaccinate forever in places where, where it's stable, in, in the Zambia, in the Zimbabwe, in the, in the Kenya, etc., uh, etc. Et Those countries are engaging now on, on, on elimination. That's great. They will need our support uh, as partners, as, do as donors, if we want them to implement their wash uh, long term uh, to ensure sustainability. They will have to engage themselves as well. We will see later on the operation and maintenance costs are also high, and that's, it has to come from the countries. Um, and last point, and uh, I'll come back on that just, uh, just right after, the lack of our capacity as a, as a partnership to ensure in-country support. Today we are doing a little bit of bricolage. How do you say that in English? Do it yourself? Yeah. 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 Uh, to get some people in a few countries, we get the support from CDC, but it's not, it's not done in a systematic way, and we have a huge demand from countries, uh, including some of the rooms are going to very soon beat me because nothing is, is yet happening, and um, it's very difficult for us to, to... We cannot do that from, from Geneva. We need to have that capacity, technically, uh, coordination, management of the project in the country. Today, it's not the case. So, that's why our first objective in, in a few months, couple of years to come, is really to uh, improve our capacity to support the countries uh, implement the roadmap. Um, and that's that. That's critical. We are, we are not going to succeed if we that cannot achieve this, while we still maintain uh, our leadership at the global level, and we'll establish a steering committee. Normally, inshallah, they will meet for the first time in June, and uh, together with the uh, right before, right after the, the annual meeting of the task force. Um, the, the the other important issue is that, that access to the to the vaccine stockpile, um, it has to be tailored to the needs. It cannot just be 
I need vaccine. I want vaccine because I'm richer than my colleague over there or because my, my president has decided this. I had a call just last week uh, of someone who asking for vaccination for no real public health reason. But he, but he was living over there and needed a vaccine for his place. And uh, this is not acceptable. So we need a mechanism that will ensure access to vaccine based on public health needs. That's what I think we have managed to do until now, more or less not perfect. Uh, and that's something that we need to uh, work on very carefully in the year to come and use it as the trigger mechanism for the wash. Uh, so make it a bit more complicated than today, but not too, pl too complicated so that it becomes inaccessible. That's the equilibrium, the balance we need to find. Uh, I think it's going to take us a year. The new mechanism, the new procedure with Gavi will start next year. So that's an opportunity for WASH, I think, as well. Uh, and last but not least, we'll have the investment case published in the coming weeks. That's a great opportunity for cholera. Uh, to reach, to raise awareness, to communicate, to advocate for cholera. Uh, that's something that we don't want to miss. The, the figures that will be presented later on by, by Melissa are very, very positive, as Tim alluded to already. Uh, and that's something really which is going to be very strong in terms of advocacy, and we don't want to miss that opportunity. I think that's all. I want to thank you very much. <coughs>